Welcome back, everybody. Glad you're with us this evening as the uh, show rolls on and Coach Nick Saban has made his way to the stage. Coach Saban's appearance on the show presented by Reveal Suits. It's what's inside. Coach, great to see you. How was Christmas for you? It was great. I had a couple of days off. You know, we gave the players three days off for Christmas like we always do. And right. It's good. We had good family time. I actually got more presents this year than I usually do, so Miss Terry <laughs> was good go. to me. Somebody asked me, and it, it was an interesting question, stuff you don't think about. They said, do you think Coach Saban can actually go out to the store and buy Christmas gifts for people? Or, or And I'm being serious. Or, or he, was, he said, or does he have to delegate that? To say, he said, I can't see the coach wandering through the aisles at a store. Uh, what do you do? Well, you know, you have a technique for everything. So when I go to shop, I'll go to a department store. I always have a lady that I tip very generously and <laughs> give her a list of things to go buy. And I hide in the back. She goes and buys them. She gets them wrapped. And that's it. There you go. Very, very simple. But what, what everybody's decided to do at my house now is they buy their own gifts. And wrap them and put them under the bed. And then act So they know what they are, but I don't really know what they got. So it's kind of backwards. I hear you. How's the week of practice been here in Dallas? It's been good. You know, the people at the Cotton Bowl are very accommodating. Um, you know, it's not been like a bowl game for the players at all. I mean, they actually voted when we got here on Sunday to not leave the hotel uh, because of the COVID situation. Um, so... But, you know, we practiced in AT&T Stadium every day except once, and we practiced at the Dallas Cowboys facility on Sunday when we got here. But it's been good. Everything's been really, really, really well done. Coach, how, how important it is that the, the players make that decision to stay, hey, we're going to lock down, we're just going to focus on football this week, coming from the players and not having to come from the coaches. It's got to make it easier from you all, but also from other players also buying in. Yeah, well, I think when it comes from the players, the, just like I always, and when you played, we did the same thing, is the players all, always decide what the curfews are. So if the players decide what the curfews are, then it's not my idea as to what time they come in and, or have to be in. It's theirs, so it's something that they take ownership of and make sure it works, you know, that way. So, and it was the same thing with this. Uh, you know, obviously, you don't want to be in a situation in – this time of the year to have a bunch of guys, you know, end up getting sick and not be able to perform and affect your ability to be able to accomplish what you work for all year. Hey, Rashad, my old uh, broadcast partner, Kenny Stabler. Now, he was the curfew coach <laughs> for his team when he played, but this is a whole lot different. I mean, this is serious stuff trying to play for a championship. You don't need anybody in the doghouse. Totally. Uh, it's definitely a serious opportunity, like you said. I mean, you only get this once in a lifetime as a college player, unless you come to Alabama and you get it more than once if you're a college player. <laughs> um, <laughs> but seriously, I mean, guys are going to get this opportunity and you have to take advantage of it. Uh, I think Coach Saban said it best that you are only remember what, um, by how you finish the season. Um, so this team won't be remembered by the Georgia game, but how they finished this 2021 season. Um, and they got a great opportunity in front of them sure yeah well that's well well said because the legacy of this team or any team is really how you finish especially when you get to playoffs and uh, I think it's important to the players and you know I didn't make the players do it but I kind of let them know that you know you're not going to decide you're not going to remember what you did on Tuesday night in Dallas right three months from now three weeks from now or three years from now that's good but you're going to remember the rest of your life what happens in the game. All right, so you got to kind of decide, you know, what are we here for? What's most important to you? Um, and, you know, it's all about how you finish. And I think it's a little bit, you know, everybody talks about all the things that you should be motivated about. Uh, but sometimes it's what you're willing to ignore. Um, like we have a lot of things out there, you know, everybody's talked about rat poison, good and bad. Um, but th those are the kind of things that you really should ignore. You know, how you played in the last game, um, how you performed all season long, uh, what the media says, who's going to win the game, what conference a team plays in. You know, none of those things really, really matter. Those are the things that you should choose to ignore. You know, when a surgeon goes in and um, wants to operate on somebody, he doesn't have all kind of clutter in the room. He has the tools that he needs to be able to perform what he needs to perform. 
And that's exactly what, you know, we want our players to be able to do. But you've got to focus on the right stuff, and you can't have a lot of mental clutter thinking about all the wrong things and letting that influence and impact, you know, how you prepare, how you get ready to play, and how you can sustain your performance in the game, you know, once it starts. So, um, you know, I think those things are really, really important. The preparation has been good, but we got to have the right mindset when we get in the game. Yeah. You know what was nice to see this week, and this gentleman is sitting right here very quietly, but Joe Pendry has been part of this organization and stepped up when necessary this week to help out. And yeah, he Joe, did. Wanted to, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, one of the, the best coaches around, and, and, and you're lucky to have him on the staff. And the players loved it. The really? players loved seeing him come back, you know, and does a really good job with the players. And then we had two coaches that missed several practices, and Joe kind of filled in for him and did an outstanding job. And, you know, it's good to have friends that are loyal enough to give up their holiday and drive from West Virginia to Tuscaloosa to fly out here and do all this with us. So we certainly appreciate he and Sandy so much. Exactly. Hey, let's go to the phones, and some things never change in this world. Tonight's first call is being brought to you by Alabama 811. Always contact 811 before you dig to know what's below. Call 811 or visit al811.com. And, of course, our first caller, Pee Wee from Grand Bay, Alabama. Hello, Pee Wee. Welcome to the show. Hey, Eli. How are you doing, sir? You have a good holiday, man. Yes, sir, I did. I'm actually up here in Huntsville uh, with my son and daughter-in-law for this week, and I will uh, be home in time to watch the game on Friday. Well, good. Uh, uh, I don't know what we what, what would do if you didn't report on the offensive line. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that, that, that's, uh, that's what I was going to talk about. And then I also have a second question. You know, the offensive line in the uh, SEC championship play game uh, played arguably their best game that they have played all season. Uh, uh, my question was, was, how have they played off of that in their preparation for this game? And uh, is any more confidence? Because they looked about as confident as I've seen them all year. And then my second question is, uh, is if you would, would you, uh, would you comment on the loss of, not to just to NFL, but to football as a whole of uh, Coach Madden yesterday? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, Coach Madden was probably as well-known a person in our profession based on, you know, his success as a player, as a coach, uh, winning the Super Bowl, getting in the playoffs like eight out of ten years or whatever, which is a significant accomplishment uh, in the NFL because it's so hard to maintain any kind of consistency because of the parity in the league. And then, you know, what he did to affect so many things when he decided that he didn't want to coach anymore um, you know, he created a great game that a lot of people enjoy playing. And he was a great commentator and gave great insight uh, in so many ways to fans and people. Uh, and I think because of his insight, he also made some changes and helped make some changes that, you know, actually helped our game. So um, there's only a few great ones like him, but he's one of the all-time great ones. Thank and you, the other, the, the other thing, uh, Pee Wee, you asked too many questions at the once. Confidence of the, the confidence <laughs> yeah. of the offensive so I, line. So I think any time you play well against a really good team, uh, like Georgia is a really good team. they got a really good front seven. Uh, and I think the guys did an outstanding job. We knew it was going to be important in that game that we're able to block their pressures uh, so that, you know, Bryce would have a chance to operate, uh, which was a problem at Auburn. And, um, you know, they really stepped up to the challenge and did a good job. I do think it helps their confidence. But I also think that it's going to be important the way this team plays in this game uh, that they do a really good job up front because they're going to do the same types of things, you know, especially in passing situations. They'll drop eight guys a lot, but they're going to try to pressure the quarterback and affect the quarterback and do it in, you know, a lot of different ways in a 3-3 stack, which is, you know, challenging. Uh, but they've done a really good job. And... Um, you know, it all come down to execution when the game starts. Yeah. And by the way, I bring uh, greetings from our mutual friend, Vern Lundquist. I spoke with him today. He was the guy who has worked the third most games with John Madden. Pat Summerall had worked 410 games with Madden. Al Michaels had worked about 150. And then Vern, who was uh, next in line. And we were talking today, and he said to please say hello to you and uh, wish you a happy new year. Yeah, Vern's a good one. He was with the SEC for a long time, and yep. we miss him. He's, he's one of the, 
you know, there's a lot of these old guys that have been around for a long time that have great professionalism in terms of what they do. And that's one of the things I always really appreciated about Vern. Yeah. Rashad, let's talk a moment about bowl games and how difficult or easy they were to prepare for for you as a player uh, after having we touched on it in the first half hour but let's expand a bit uh, having had three weeks off if you will before the ball game comes about yeah uh, in the bowl game it, it's a time to where you get back to the basics uh, at least for us when we were at Alabama and coach Saban was there and I'm sure it was the same during this time period you get an opportunity to where it's a lot of ones versus ones we get a chance to get back to those fundamental things uh, tackling uh, getting back to shedding blocks a lot of more things early on that you don't get a chance to do week in and week out because you're preparing for Tennessee or you're preparing for Florida now it's an opportunity to get back to those fundamental things that got us here so build on that foundation and then as the week comes closer to playing ten uh, Cincinnati at this point you get back into your regular routine so for me it was an opportunity to to go out and sharpen up on some things that I may have faded on during the season maybe I wasn't a great tackler later in the season as I was early on so now this is a chance for me to go out and focus on those fundamentals doing individual drills and doing team periods so whatever those things were that we we were struggling with coming out of that Georgia game. It was an opportunity for us to get back against good competition, um, which is our ones versus ones, yeah. and, and battle it out. So that's what I enjoyed the most about that bowl season. You got back to that fundamental, a little bit of that, uh, I guess, uh, training camp mode before you get back into, you know, playing this game and traveling out. And, JP, how about preparing for a team that you don't often see? Uh, I mean, we, we see Tennessee every year. We see this team every year. Then all of a sudden in comes a Texas Tech or whomever it might be. Tougher on a QB to prepare for a team you're not familiar with at all? You know, I, I think it'd probably be easier because now you've got three weeks to go back and basically go watch the entire season. You can watch every play that this team has had where during a normal week you might only go back four or five weeks. So you can really dive deep in, in finding out what their DNA is, what they've been like all season long, and then trying to predict okay, here's some things they might change up because we know we're going to see new stuff from them, just like they're going to see new things from our offense and defense. So you're trying to anticipate what that defensive coordinator or offensive coordinator is going to do. But I think it's it's the, the bowl preparation is all about mindset. I remember when Coach Saban's first year in 2007, you know, everybody talks about that 2008, and we finally turned it around. But I think it started in the bowl practice yeah. the year before yeah. where, you know, we were 6-6 six and six and we lost a lot of close games. I think we, we get, did get back to fundamentals, but but really changed our mindset, and yeah. we're able to just continue that into 2008. You know, these guys are very gracious because <laughs> when they were playing and we worked on those fundamentals like it was camp, like for three or four days before we actually started <laughs> ball practice, they complained like crazy. So they're, they're very gracious. In, in uh, yeah. It's amazing, <laughs> how that, amazing how that changes. Coach, right in front of us through the uh, spotlight glare, we've got a gentleman at the microphone. Good evening, sir. Good afternoon. Good evening. First of all, Coach, God bless you and roll tide. Thank you. You're obviously the greatest coach in sports history in any sport, the master motivator and recruiter. Before you arrived, we Alabama Crimson Tide fans were blessed to have le legendary coach Bear Bryant walked the sidelines at Bryant-Denny Stadium. Do you have any theories as to why both of you ended up in Tuscaloosa, Alabama? <laughs> <laughs> I can't speak for Coach Bryant, but um, he was an outstanding coach and probably the greatest coach of all time, in my opinion, uh, because he won so many different ways in a different era. You know, he won running the wishbone. He ran throwing a ball with good quarterbacks. Um, and I think he did it with the basic fundamental things that we've tried to, you know, sort of steal from him in terms of, you know, discipline and people playing with great intangibles, effort, toughness, things like that, that really don't take ability. That's what he was a master at getting players to do. And uh, I think it's a little more challenging, you know, now. I think the one thing that you mentioned was recruiting, and I think that Good recruiting makes for good coaching because it's really hard to coach well when you don't have really good players, players who will play together, players who have the ability to do the things that you want to do so that you can feature their talents. And I think we've had a lot of really good coaches that have done a great job of recruiting. We have a really good university, uh, support from our administration, Dr. Bell, uh, 
the university community does a great job of helping us get some of the best players. We have a great history of success in graduating the players and creating value for the players. So um, that's one of the reasons that we've been able to continue to have success because we have a great support group. I'm sure Coach Bryan had a great support group when he was here and that enabled him to have the success that he had as well. So uh, I know why I ended up in Tuscaloosa. You know, I was a college coach, um, had some success as a college coach, always thought I wanted to be an NFL coach, went to the NFL. When I was in the NFL prior to, we didn't have free agency. So you had the same players on your team for a long time. So I didn't really have experience with salary cap, free agency, and all that. So that changed the game dramatically in the NFL. So when I went there, it wasn't quite as much fun as it was the first couple times I was in the league. So um, I was actually anxious to get back to college and thought it was a blessing that we would have an opportunity to come to a place like Alabama. And it has been special to Terry and I and our family for 15 years now. And it's turned out to be a blessing for all of us. We're coming right back. We've got a lot more together. If you'd like to join the conversation, toll-free number 877-202-BAMA. We're back with more in just a moment. You're listening to the 2021 Cotton Bowl College Football Playoff Preview Show. We're live from the Hilton Anatole Hotel in Dallas on the Crimson Tide Sports Network from Learfield. Welcome you back to the 2021 Cotton Bowl College Football Playoff Preview Show with Coach Nick Saban. It's presented in part by Reveal Suits. It's what's inside Reveal Suits, where passion meets fashion. Shop online at revealsuits.com. The coach is with us, so too my broadcast partners, John Parker Wilson and Rashad Johnson. Coach, you're obviously sitting right next to uh, an outstanding defensive back, not only collegiately, but Rashad also uh, having a great NFL career. Uh, we're not going to compare things, but when you think of Rashad, I automatically think of DBs. And when you think of DBs, you think of, uh, of Bryant and Gardner, the two outstanding cornerbacks for the University of Cincinnati. Uh, as good as advertised, you've seen all the film. Tell me about yeah. it. They have very good – both those guys are very good players. They also have some very good edge rushers. Um, they do a really good job with their defensive scheme. They play a lot of man-to-man. -man. Uh, they try to mix it up, and the two corners do a really, really good job of playing man-to-man. -man. They're long, bigger guys that, um, you know, do a good job of jamming people. And it's going to be a challenge for us to get away from some of those guys and – you know, to formation them so that we, we have the best opportunity to get our best players on the best matchups that we possibly can. But Rashad, when you were getting ready to see a, a, a Bryce Young to Jamison Williams type of combination, reputation for the DB is fine, but bottom line is you got to slow down that, uh, that great pass-catch combo. Definitely. Um, and those two have a history record this year of what they're putting together. And I think what Coach said in terms of how they defensively, you know, have great edge rushers. You want to dis disrupt the quarterback if you can. Um, and then cornerbacks that can play man-to-man -man that can get in their face. Um, and But like he said, with us offensively, finding formations that we can, you know, move guys around and put them in the right positions to get the matchups that we're looking for is, is the way that you're going to be able to move the ball offensively. But defensively, if you got guys up front that's rushing the pass or that's causing and disruption it makes your life easy as a defensive back and obviously Cincinnati has done that so it makes you know Kobe Bryant and Amat Gardner year even better when they got guys up front playing that well and by the way his name is Kobe Bryant and he's changing his jersey number this week to number eight in honor of the uh, late uh, NBA star so uh, don't think we misspoke on the name uh, we are going to the phones right now. Our next caller is Adam. He's with us from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Hi, Adam. Welcome to the show. Hey, Eli. Thanks for taking my call. Yes, sir. Uh, Rashad, John Parker, how are you guys doing tonight? Doing well. Hope you're doing, doing well. How are you doing, Adam? Coach Saban, just want to uh, wish all you guys a uh, very <laughs> Christmas and happy new year. Well, thank, thank you. I appreciate all the that. All that you all have made. Uh, you back to the University of Alabama. It's been a treat to watch you over the years. And, uh, Coach, I want to ask a non-football-related question. Watching your press conferences over the years, you speak to, to a lot of things uh, related to growing these young men, teaching them life skills to be successful even after they've left university. Uh, for you personally, what are those areas 
that you still struggle to master both as it pertains to being a coach professionally, but also uh, away from the field, away from the game? What are those areas of life that uh, you still look to improve yourself upon on a yearly basis, uh, especially as we move into the new year and we all look to uh, kind of perfect or at least attempt to, no one will never get there. Uh, what are those areas that, that you still strive to uh, master in your own, in your own life? Well, I think leadership uh, is something that uh, I think is really, really important when you're involved with, let's say, 125 guys on your team, coaches in your organization, young people who are trying to become coaches and our interns and graduate assistants. So, you know, and that all starts with, you know, setting a good example. Uh, being somebody that somebody can emulate, uh, you know, caring enough about somebody else to serve them for their benefit. You know, it's kind of manipulation when you do it for your benefit, but um, you want to serve them for their benefit and uh, be a blessing to how they develop. And it's not the same for all players. So the most challenging thing to me, for me, is, you know, to find, you know, what really makes someone respond in a way that's going to be beneficial to them because most of the things that we're trying to do is to create value in a young person so that they can be more successful in life but sometimes they don't realize you know what those things are um, and you know I try to make all the players in our on our team you know tell me what their goals are I meet with each player individually twice a year and I'd say what are your goals what are your aspirations what do you want to accomplish what do you want to do and they don't really know it when they tell me but then I can always use those things and ask them, how is this behavior helping you accomplish any of those goals that you told me you wanted to accomplish? So everybody's got to learn how to edit their behavior in a way that's going to help them have a chance to accomplish the goals that they have. And that's a choice that everybody, you know, needs to make. Uh, and, you know, sometimes it's difficult uh, for guys to make those choices and you do got to do things that you're not comfortable doing. Uh, but I think in the long run, that is what helps you create the habits that you need to create so that you can be successful. So I think the most challenging thing for me, because I always feel like when there is a guy that I can't seem to affect, you know, in a way that's going to benefit him and his future, you know, I feel like I'm failing that player, I'm failing that person. And um, that's the most challenging thing I think we have to deal with. Jim, thank you very much. A great question from uh, Adam in Chattanooga. Let's take a questioner right here at the hotel. Uh, coach, straight uh, behind, in, in front of us. Yes, sir. Good evening. Hey, Coach. Roll Tide. Roll Tide. Uh, Rashad, thank you for your time earlier. I got to speak with you. Eli, you took a picture of my wife. Thank you. But My pleasure. Anytime. Um, I got to say, Coach, I love your vocabulary. It's all about execution and domination and physicality, but you, to be physical at the line of scrimmage, you have to be big. But I was watching the Minnesota game last night, and they commented that they have, I believe, the biggest offensive line in college football, bigger than the Minnesota Vikings, yet they're not here at the Cotton Bowl. My point being is mindset really is where it's at. You know, if I'm down 40 to nothing, how do you how do you get Rashad and JP and all these guys like what is their mindset tonight? How do you coach them tonight after practice after film? What are you telling them or, or encouraging them to do with their mind before they go to bed or before they get on the field? JP, let's see if the answers match here. Give us a quick one-liner about what the coach did to to do the mindset here. Well, I think I think it's it's the same throughout the entire year, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if it's February 15th or if it's December 29th or whatever today is. Like, you you need to you need to be doing the things that are are going to be beneficial to yourself and the team, regardless of what day it is, and and it it, it and it shouldn't change all year long. Totally, I agree. Uh, own your box, you know. Do your job. Um, those are the things that are spoken on tonight. Um, and the game, you know, is won tonight. Visualize what you're gonna do on the field, you know, on Saturday. You know, those are the things that are being talked upon. Um, I would think, you know, today heading into a game as big as we're playing on Friday night. Well, I think what we try to emphasize with the players, you know, you've heard me say before, there's no scoreboard. So it shouldn't really affect how you play if you're ahead 40 to nothing or behind 40 to nothing. Because the goal and the objective is to get every player to reach their full potential, you know, as a person, as a student, and as a player. So... And that's what's going to benefit them the most, you know, in their future. So the circumstances surrounding the situation shouldn't impact someone 
who is trying to be the best that they can be. You know, I tell players all the time, when I was in the NFL, they'd make me a cut-up of a player. Uh, and I evaluated them as to where we we're going to put them on the draft board. I didn't know who they were playing. I didn't know what the score of the game was. I didn't know any of those things. All I did is I watched how you played. So why would it have any impact if you're playing a good player, a not-so-good player, a good team, a not-so-good team? You're ahead in the game by 14. You're behind in the game by 14. So you're trying to create value for yourself, and you're trying to help your team be successful. Those are the two things that you want to do. So it's going to benefit you the most to be the best player that you can be every play in the game, one play at a time, like it has a history and a life of its own, and you do it over and over and over and over. And if you're going to dominate someone, you don't do it on the first play, you don't do it on the fifth play, you don't do it on the 20th play. Sometimes it's the 50th play in the game before the guy says, uncle, I quit. All right, this guy's got me. All right, so that's how you have to, the mindset that you have to have when you play in a game. Uh, you want to be relentless, you know, as a competitor, and you want to play hard all the time, and those things are what's going to create value for you in your future and doing the right things on the field and off the field, probably more so than ever. You know, last year before the draft, we had, what, six guys drafted in the first round, two in the second round. I probably got 30 phone calls three days leading up to the draft. I never got asked one question what kind of player a guy was, not one. What kind of leader is he? Is he going to be good in our organization? Is he a good teammate? Is he somebody you really want on your team? Those are the questions I got. Nothing about how they play. All right, so more than ever before, I think what you do off the field as well as what you do on the field is really, really important. And not to recognize that and try to provide leadership to help players create that value is a real mistake and really selling them short uh, of what they can accomplish and what they can do. And, and that's yeah. one of the reasons the man is as successful as he is. We're coming right back more with Coach Saban, more with Rashad Johnson and John Parker Wilson. This segment of tonight's show is sponsored by New Coke Zero Sugar. New look, improved taste, New Coke Zero Sugar. We're coming right back to the Cotton Bowl preview show from the Anatole Hotel in Dallas, Texas on the Crimson Tide Sports Network from Learfield. Hey, and Coach Oates has had him t his team playing pretty well. Do you learn stuff, whether it's from Coach Oates or whomever? Are, are, are you deep into your career that you're, you never stop looking, though, and learning stuff from other coaches and how they handle things and so on? No question. I mean, I, I always enjoy, um, you know, you never arrived in this business, so you're always looking for a better way. Uh, I think that's something that's really, really important for all coaches, all teachers, and uh, people out there who have to, you know, try to help young people. But um, I constantly, you know, like reading books. Sure. Um, and, like, I love talking to Coach K. Uh, I get on his radio show, and I ask him more questions than he asks me. Um, so, but I think those things are really important to do the very thing that I talked about before, which was most challenging, is how do you impact and affect your players on your team so that they have a better chance to be successful, which is the biggest challenge. And uh, it's not really about the X's and O's, and although you do learn things from that standpoint too. Uh, I love basketball. You know, if I was a little taller, I'd have probably liked to have been a basketball player, not a football <laughs> player. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing how the game has changed and the style that we play, you know, shooting threes and shooting layups and, you know, the analytics of a three-point shot being more valuable than, a, you know, trying to get a really good 15-foot shot. So uh, it's kind of interesting to see how those things evolve. And, you know, football's evolved the same way. You know, no huddle, spread, uh, RPOs, all these things didn't exist, you know, 10, 12 years ago. So you got to adapt with them, and that's always a challenge in terms of how do you do that. Now, Rashad, did you play other sports in Sullivan growing up? I did. I actually played basketball uh, growing up. My first scholarship was uh, to a small Division II school in basketball. So I really? uh, could, could hoop a little bit, I guess you could say. Not too well, but a little bit. <laughs> How about you, JP? I played baseball. Yeah, um, your brother's a great baseball player. Both. I, yeah, I, we were, we're a baseball yeah. family. I was a black sheep that uh, went and played football because I had to. They started throwing the sliders in the curveballs, it was, it was <laughs> done for me. For so you, I was, huh? I was that got me too. Yeah, I'm <laughs> telling you, it's not fun. It, I hear you. We've got another visitor here at the hotel with a question straight back there, Coach. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. I'm a million-dollar band mom of a fourth-year student. 
Uh, at MDB, got on buses at midnight last night at Moody and took 10 hours to get here, dressed out at practice one and a half hours after arrival in Dallas for a two hour practice in Flower Mound. Uh, but they do it because they feel from you and from Ms. Terry how much you appreciate and value their contribution to the program. So I'm curious to know and hear from you your general feeling how the music and energy that MDB students bring to our team affect our success. You know, there's all kinds of things that are traditions. And one of the great traditions, I think, of our school and college sports in general, but especially at the University of Alabama, is um, I think the band uh, is a symbol of a lot of traditions, the fight song, um, and a lot of things that they do. And believe me, I really do appreciate more than you know, and I go talk to them every year about how important what they do is. And I know they make a lot of sacrifices, and I know it's a lot of hard work for them, but uh, there's an expectation, you know, when they march on the field, uh, what people expect to see. Uh, there's a uniform, just like I won't change our uniforms because when Alabama runs out of the tunnel, everybody has an expectation of what they're going to see. Yeah, All right, and that's, exactly. that, that's, that's important. It's a part of tradition. It's a part of things that people cherish and remember. Uh, and I think the band is a really, really big part of that. And I think the energy and enthusiasm that they create uh, is something the fans enjoy. And I know the players appreciate very much as well. Yeah. You, that no question. The Million Dollar Band, some of the hardest working folks on uh, campus, the largest student organization on campus, better than 400. You know, th there's no accordion player, though, Coach. Uh, that was not going to fit into your, into your calling. And, when and I, knew, I knew that when I was nine years old. That's why <laughs> I got started playing sports so I could get out of practice and accordion. I hear you. I hear you. Let's talk about uh, Desmond Ritter, the uh, outstanding quarterback for uh, Cincinnati. Folks know his name like the back of their hand. What's he like? You've seen all of his games on, on tape. Uh, tell us a bit more about what we'll be facing on Friday afternoon. Well, he's a really good athlete. Um, he's a good passer. He's a very smart player. He's got a lot of experience, so he really does a good job of redirecting protections, throwing the ball the right place, really good understanding of their offense and how to execute it. Uh, he also can make, he's fast. I mm -hmm. mean, he's tall, but very fast. And uh, they do a lot of quarterback runs uh, that are challenging for the defense that are very complementary to other things that they do uh, that makes it difficult. Like they run a lot of quarterback draws, so you have to defend a quarterback draw all the time, even on third down when you think you're just going to defend the pass um, and they run a lot of zone option street plays where he keeps the ball and uh, very challenging to the perimeter players and everybody's got to fit it exactly right or they make explosive plays on you. But a guy Rashad when you sit down and watch tape mm -hmm. I mean can you get into a guy's mind and figure out what's going to happen by extensive film study? Definitely. Um, watching film is, is the greatest preparation that you have. Uh, learning tendencies, understanding formations. Um, teams tip themselves off of those things. So definitely as a defensive back, uh, linebacker, those guys are watching film and reading their keys. You're going to get the tips and understand what plays to expect on, you know, after a first and 10, say, you know, they throw an incomplete pass. Uh, they may come back and have a tendency of running the ball on second and long. So just playing those tendencies and understanding as a player, you're not playing every down, but you're playing what you've seen on film um, and understanding from the, the formations and the down and distance and where they are on the field. It all limits the playbook for a team um, once you've diagnosed and studied them well enough um, and knowing our guys that they've studied them well enough. And John Parker, you got to have the physical tools clearly, but so much is mental. I mean, you, you, you can't just be some dunce and then step in and play successful winning football. Absolutely. I mean, the, the mental part of especially playing quarterback, just like every other position uh, on football, is the most important thing. And obviously, this guy's got it. Desmond Ritter, 44 and 5 as a starter. So this guy's won 44 games in his college career. That's a lot of victories. I don't care who you're playing. I don't care if you're playing checkers. If you're 44 and 5, uh, you're doing a lot of things right. You're making a lot of people around you better. Um, just like they, they spread the ball out a lot to a lot of different receivers, multiple tight ends. Um, you know, even running backs out of the backfield. So mm -hmm. he's able, like we've seen Bryce Young this, this year, of finding the right guy to go with the ball. Desmond Ritter does a good job of, of understanding what we're trying to do to him on defense 
and then uh, adjusting, you know, with their, whatever route or combination they're doing to attack our defense. Coach yeah. Fickle's done well there, Coach. He really has. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And this quarterback is a very good player. But just to comment on something that Rashad talked about is, you know, for our defensive players, and Rashad was one of the best we've ever had at doing this, we yep. give – we have about 20 – what we call signal callers assignments that we give a player on Monday when we do the scouting report, whether it's bird and rabbits, like who, who, who gives away run pass in the offensive line or whatever, you know, what's, what's the best third and three to six routes. I mean, there's like 20 different things that, um, you know, we have players do. And I think his was always motions. Motions, shifts and motions. Okay, so shifts and motions, that, that was his deal. And he used to come and see me. I, and I make a real form, you know, where this is the motion. This is what they do when they go in motion. This is what they do when they shift to certain things. They run the same plays over and over and over. They call the same formation the same play with this motion. This is what you can expect. And he used to give the best reports of anybody that we ever had. And it was always the motion adjustments. And I can't find anybody to do that now. There's so many shifts in motion. <laughs> yeah, in <like> every play. <laughs> you know, it's amazing, though, the stuff that you guys have to go through that we have no idea. I mean, folks think we all know football. We enjoy it. We love it. And, but, man, the, the work that goes on preparing to be a successful team, it's, uh, it's unconscionable to us normal folks. It's a lot of work. I mean, it's a lot of time spent. There's no doubt about it. And, and um you, you gotta love. You gotta love doing. I think that's what yeah. what definitely Rashad and, and, and myself and all these guys that we have right now on this team. I, you know, listening to the press conferences and hearing what they're saying to the media. You you, you can say, well, they're just you know talking to the media and they're they're trying to play it clean, but our guys they say a lot. And I, and I, I think what I've seen, uh, especially throughout this season, is they mean it. Mm -hmm. You know, you see guys like Will Anderson getting on the mic and mm -hmm. Phil Mathis and. Obviously, Bryce, they, they, they mean what they say, and, and I think that means a lot. But, Coach Saban, I got a question for you. Of all the shifts and motions, how much can you prepare for this game like a normal game? Say we're playing Tennessee week 10. Is this more like a normal season game or like we're playing Miami where you don't have a lot of tape? Are they, how much do you think uh, are we going to, you know, does a typical team change from, you know, SEC championship to now playing in the bowl game? Well, I don't think there's any question about the fact that we're going to see different things in the game than what we prepare for, mm -hmm. probably on both sides of the ball and probably even on special teams. But that's not, that's not unusual for, for our team. Uh, just about every week that we play, uh, people do some different things to try to take advantage of whatever they see that you did or didn't do uh, and how they can take advantage of it. So you always have to be able to adapt. I think that's the number one thing that we talk to our players about when it's in the game. And you see how our players go on the sideline, sit on the bench, the coaches are talking to them the whole time, and showing them mostly different things or things that we misfit or didn't block correctly or whatever it is so that we can get it corrected so we can, you know, play the next play and keep making those adjustments and those adaptations as we go. But, you know, you make the comment that players work hard and there's a lot that goes into it. Mm -hmm. I, I think if you want to really be good at anything, and I'm sure there's a lot of people here tonight uh, that are really good at what they do. All right, you work hard. All right, you make a decision, you make a commitment and of what you want to accomplish and what you want to do. Then you say to yourself, I will do the things that I need to do to be able to do that. And um, so I think that's what football players do too. I think that's what football teams um, try to do together as a group and that's what makes this a great team game because there's more participants that have to be successful and accountable to each other to be able to have success on whether it's offense defense or special teams well said we're coming right back we got lots more to go with the coach so don't you go away we're live tonight in dallas texas here on the crimson tide sports network from learfield College football playoff preview show presented by Reveal Suits, Toyota, and Cook's Pest Control. A big thank you as well to a couple of our longtime sponsors, Golden Flake and Coca-Cola, always involved in everything we do here on the network, and we appreciate them more than you can imagine. And, Coach, now it is time for your final word as we lead up to uh, Friday night's game. 
or Friday afternoon's game. Your final word each week presented by Mercedes-Benz. Mercedes-Benz, the best or nothing. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody who supports, you know, our team. Uh, we've had great support all year long. We've had great atmosphere and environment in Bryant-Denny Stadium. I know lots of fans travel lots of places. Uh, SEC championship game, we had a lot of great energy and enthusiasm. So I want to thank everyone for that, uh, and I hope you have a very happy holiday. But I think for this game, all right, the most important thing is the main thing has to be the main thing. You've got to keep the main thing the main thing. I mean, you've got to be able to focus on what you need to do from an energy, effort, discipline to execute, accountability standpoint, and not be affected by external factors and clutter or anything else. And I would, I would say that everyone in the organization, including the fans, all right, should do the same thing. Don't make assumptions. I right, don't think that things are going to be easy because it will be a very difficult task all right, in this game all right, to impose your will on whoever you compete against. I mean, there are underdogs who upset people all the time. All right, so we have to play to our potential. We have to play with our energy, effort, discipline to execute, accountability, enthusiasm, uh, and as well as the fans and everybody who supports the team. And it's no different than a fighter. You know, a fighter prepares for a fight. We've prepared for this fight. Uh, and now we have, what, not even 48 hours until the fight starts. But the fighter also has to prepare for taking a punch. A uh, fighter also has to prepare for having a bad round and be able to go back and fight the next round. And these kinds of abilities to overcome adversity, you know, as a competitor in a game uh, or in any profession is really what helps you be successful. Uh, and that's what our team needs to do for 60 minutes in this game. And that your energy and enthusiasm will certainly help them be able to do that. Coach, as always, sir, thanks so much for your time. Great to have you. you on the show. And uh, have a wonderful, wonderful Friday. And, of course, the coach sharing so many of the keys to victory that are driven by local Toyota dealers. Visit your local Toyota dealer or toyota.com now and okay, take coach. advantage of the amazing deals on our full line of vehicles. No matter your destination, Toyota goes with you. Toyota, let's go places.